more about that in a moment. Got it. Okay. Um, so again, as I said, it's going to be an hors d'oeuvre. It's not uh, the full meal. Um, I know that some people have contacted me and said, you know, why is Rotary doing this? You know, what kind of topic is this for Rotary? And I'm very proud of the fact that you know, many clubs have gotten involved in some real issues in the community around diversity and around um, sex trafficking and around homelessness. And I know I was involved in a project in Ozaki County and the vast majority of homeless were teen young, teenage youngsters who had been kicked out of their homes because of their sexual identity or gender identification. And so, this is a topic for us. When we look at the social issues, it can't be excluded. And I'm so grateful that you guys are here tonight. Um, we hoped that those dissenting voices or those people questioning why Rotary would be involved in this would join us tonight. Because I think what you'll also learn is that none of us can really agree on, you know, all of us being on the same page. <laughs> And, and everything being a clean slate with one another. So we are going to move into first a panel. Um, and each of the panelists will be able to do a five minute introduction and sharing about themselves, their experiences. And then um, there'll be an interview that Len, uh, who I'll introduce later, a member of our task force will uh, be interviewing someone who can give us additional insight as well as resources. All of you participating tonight will receive an email after this and a link to resources that she and others have made available so that you can continue this journey uh, beyond the hors d'oeuvre. Um, personally, my name is Angela Rester. I've been a Rotarian since 1985 and past district governor from 1998 to 99. I'm the founder of the Rotary Club of Milwaukee Amigos After Hours. But more importantly, I'm an aunt and an aunt to someone who is gay. And I could see this development since she was three, four years of age. I'm a friend. Um, I have had probably 28 or more people who've come out to me, and that is a gift that they were comfortable sharing. But I also know that many of them had great challenges and even suicidal and cutting. And because of my personal interaction with those people, this topic is important to me. So before we go into the panel, I do want to say that I know that some of you may not want your sharing or your questions at the Q&A time at the end to be public or recorded. And because of that, Marta Carrion, if you look in the chat, um, and if you don't know how to do all this, because I didn't at one time either, you'll find a chat bubble. And if you click on that, you'll find names that you can communicate either individually or to everybody. If you look for the name Marta, M-A-R-T-A, Carrion, you can click on her name, send her your question, and she will then read that question to the group, thereby allowing you to remain anonymous. Um, so that's how we're set up. Um, Thank you all for being here again. And we're going to start with Brenda Peterson tonight. Um, Brenda, she is um, an intuitive artist messenger. Now that may be something you've not heard of. Um, I got to know Brenda when she was the executive director of the volunteer center here in Ozaki County. But as Brenda has said, um, art is food for her soul uh, to create art is divine. She gets her inspiration from life, nature, from a word, an emotion. And she does truly see color and images in her head that she then can release and put on uh, canvas walls. Uh, she uses her palette knife, she spray paints. She has a deep love for learning 
um, really about everything. She said in here more about art, but I know Brenda and she loves to learn about everything. She is an intuitive. She shares that gift with others. Um, and she has a lot of things to be proud of, including uh, creating commissioned metallic pieces for a spa and wine bar mural. She's participated in the, the UWWC Art Studio for uh, Festivals of the Arts, and she competed in her first plein air event this year. Uh, Brenda has a unique story. And Brenda, thank you for being here tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. Hi, Lil. Thank you for having me. I'm really, really grateful that this is a conversation and that you're willing to listen. Um, and we can ask questions in a safe place to ask questions as well. I think a lot of us would like to have more open discussions about this topic. And one of the things is we're afraid we're gonna misspeak or not say the right thing. And this is a safe place to do that. So I'm very, very grateful that Angie called me to do this and that you're having this discussion. Um, my family, um, my son, Owen, was born Amy. Um, and then we have, we have what, five minutes to get this in. So I'm gonna like kind of spew out everything here. Um, my, it's hard for me now pronouns to go back, which is one of the things that we talk about is the pronouns for the LGBT community. And that's so hard for everyone, including me. This is nine years that I've had a transgender son. So Owen, I'm gonna go back and use Owen for now. Owen came out at 16 and uh, told me I, he needed to tell me something. And he, the next morning he told me that he at the time was female and he was, he liked girls, that's all he said. And I said, great, okay, uh, whatever, I love you. Um, pick up your socks and put them in the laundry. That's basically the conversation, which is what I told Angie. And I said, it wasn't a big deal. We knew, we knew you know um, something beforehand and we completely support our children. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't a big uh, deal at all. It, Owen then at, at 22 did announce he was becoming transgender. So he was going to change from Amy, our Amy to Owen, and it was a three year transition. And that was a harder, um, harder thing to accept and a harder thing to um, deal with. And for one is it's our expectations our expectations of what our son or daughter will be when they grow up, our expectations of going to our daughter's wedding instead of our son's wedding. So it's all about that. And um, to me, it is, of course, we're going to support our children. Of course, we're going to do whatever we need to do to assist in this transition. Again, like the clues or the things along the way, um, um, we had an inkling for, we actually knew uh, before he announced he was, uh, he never said lesbian, he announced he liked girls and then he announced he was transitioning. We basically had a clue of that or knowledge of that before. But as I said, it was not, um, the transition was harder because my expectations were involved and um, what I dreamed of for our life. So it just had to look differently is all it was. And as far as, far as I'm concerned, that's what it, what it is, um, is that our spirit, uh, what we're here on this planet in this life to do is our, our goals and um, however you need to, to do that goal. And I just want my child to be cherished. I want, him to have someone to cherish and someone to cherish him. I was also very, very afraid of the society. Um, he's a smaller man and um, there was violence. He was in Colorado when he transitioned, he came back to Milwaukee. And one of the things he decided before I moved back to Milwaukee was the percentage of acceptance in Milwaukee. And at that time it was very low. There's like, I think, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna have the numbers here, but I'm gonna say a, like a one to five scale and, and Milwaukee was at a two for, two for acceptance. So I was afraid for my son that he would be, is it, am I, am I out of time already? <laughs> he, not yet. That he would, he would not, not be yet. accepted. I'm sorry, Angie, I can't see if your one is up there. I can't see it all. All right, I'll just keep talking, just like clang the bell or something. You have so, two minutes. Okay, thank you. That was, that was the, I was afraid of that. When he did move back from Colorado, he did pick Madison as a more supportive 
place for LGBT community and also that he could make um, he could make more inroads and he could support his community as well in Madison besides Milwaukee. Um, so that is, uh, that's my story. Um, I was in nonprofit and with nonprofit, we were supported by United Way. We had a lot of training and one of the trainings per year was the LGBT training. Same thing as this is let's talk about it. Let's talk, thank you. Let's talk about um, what we can do to support the community and then be safe with how we ask the questions. A safe place to ask the questions, a safe place to learn the language because the language is different and not what we're used to. Most of you, it looks like grew up where I was where they meant two people instead of one person. So it's very hard for pronouns. My son yells at me now because I'm very bad at it. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> thanks for inviting me and thanks for having this conversation. Brenda, we'll hear more from you and you'll be part of the Q&A. Next, many of you already know Brian Monroe. Um, if you haven't met Brian in Rotary, then you have not been to many of the district <laughs> events um, or he has not been to your club speaking about the variety of things that he does. Um, Brian and his wife, Nancy Newman, reside in Mequon, Wisconsin and Crystal Falls, Michigan. And they have three amazing adult children, four incredible grandchildren, they're business partners, and they're currently involved with real estate development um, of urban infill projects of former brownfield sites. He's a proud Rotarian of the Mequon Thienesville Rotary Club, Sunrise Club, since 1999. He's participated in many, many roles in the district, and he himself has sponsored 26 Rotarians into Rotary. He's participated with Nancy in eight Rotary Humanitarian Projects to Rural Guatemala. And I've, I've been there with him. Dorothy Krupa, who's on the, in the webinar, has been there and seen the work that he and his wife have put into that fabulous project. And he attributes that first trip to, to Guatemala as when he became a Rotarian. We talk about being in Rotary be, versus being a Rotarian. And uh, he worked with Nancy in that dental clinic and realized that first year, now I know what it is to be a Rotarian. He's also very involved with leadership in the United Church North and is active on their social justice committee. I've been to a number of their programs and I'm impressed with what they do. He is a board member of the Milwaukee River Works Development Corp. And he's an executive member of the NAACP of Ozaki County and a cabinet member of the Interfaith of Greater Milwaukee. Uh, he does have adult children, remember, <laughs> and he did say he's happy to be with us tonight. Brian? Thank you so much, Angie, for that introduction. <clears throat> Thank you to um, everyone who's participating tonight. I mean, it's tough on a sun, summer night to be here with us, but this is important work that we're doing. Uh, Brenda, thank you for sharing. That was very special, and uh, I appreciate uh, Angie did a great job of uh, rounding up some uh, family members and friends to host and co-host tonight. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Marta. Um, I grew up, I mean, I, I, I'm doing this from my phone, so I don't see the whole gallery view, but I have a pretty good feeling that most of us on tonight are in my generation or our generation. And growing up in my generation, I'm gonna speak for myself, we didn't have too much exposure to um, people who were uh, attracted to the same sex. Uh, and uh, you look at the religion that I grew up in, it was, you know, us versus them, this religion versus that religion. So you sort of grew up with this us versus them. And um, I probably the first time I encountered um, a, a gay, gay friend who was in college and um, he he was great, but I was afraid to go out with him by myself. I always included uh, some girls because I didn't want people to associate me being gay with this guy. Um, so that was, I, I wish we had these sessions, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it would have made a world of difference. So I, I've, I've had some great friends over the years that are same sex uh, attracted and Growing up with three kids in high school, our kids all seemed to be uh, tracking like uh, 
as a as a parent would would hope they'd attract. Our oldest daughter um, dated guys in high school, and when she got off to college, um, she started. She was in Madison for the first uh, couple of years, and some of the stuff that she was doing out there was just a kind of question. But then she went to Australia and with my wife, and Nancy came back and said, "There's something that's I." I I, I, this happening over in Australia and I really can't talk about it. So I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea. So when she finally did come home, um, here's this girl who left with long hair and she had a shaved head, studded uh, necklace on, piercings, tattoos all over. It was kind of in your face. And that's how my daughter uh, oftentimes presented herself, especially to her dad as in my face. So when she told me she was gay, and I said, oh, you're just doing this. Um, it's a tough decision. You're choosing to do this, aren't you? You're just doing this to um, yank our chain. And she said, no, this, you don't understand, Dad. You don't understand. But through f friends and through understanding, I, I became to accept and encourage a relationship that she was in to the point where we came back. We now, I, again, I didn't talk to my friends about it. I didn't say, hey, guess what? I'm so happy to let you know that my daughter's gay. Um, we were at a party at our house. We had just come back from our daughter's wedding in Canada. She married a Canadian. And um, someone said to me at the party in front of about 30 people at our house, oh, I understand that um, your daughter just married a nice Jewish boy. I said, you're partly right. She married a nice Jewish woman. And the whole room went completely quiet. They didn't know what to do. There was that pregnant pause for quite a bit. And then one of our friends came up to me afterwards and she goes, thank you so much for saying that because my son's gay and I don't know who to talk to. So it really is a shame that people can't find the time to talk about this and share these emotions. But at the end of the day, I'm very proud of my daughter. She does some great work. I love her dearly. And she's the mother of two phenomenal kids. So I'm a happy uh, father for all three of our kids and our grandkids. Thank you, Angie. No, thank you, Brian, for sharing. And again, you'll be a part of our panel with the Q&A. Next, I want to introduce Heath Johnson. And, and Heath is an HIV prevention worker in Scott County, Iowa. He lives in Rock Island, Illinois. And Heath grew up in a rural Illinois community. And he came out as gay to his friends and his family in the late 90s as, as a teenager. Um, he attended Northern Illinois University. He holds a bachelor's degree in psychology. And he's going to share his own coming out stories, relationships with the LGBTQIA+. Uh, community, some letters in there I need some information on, and he will share, um, and he's, he totally sympathizes for those who struggle with acceptance on both sides of the coming out experience. I've known Heath since he was um, involved as a farmer in farmer training at uh, uh, Wellspring. He is the most gracious, welcoming, happy artistic and just a charming person, delightful person to talk to. And I always enjoy the mental expansion when I talk with Heath. Um, so Heath, thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Angie, for having me. And thank you everybody for joining in this conversation, especially if it makes you a little bit uncomfortable or if like Angie said, you wonder why you're here or why Rotary is interested in addressing these topics. Um, if I could sum up everything I'm gonna try to cram into five minutes, I, it would be that we are all affected by bias. We all have biases. Um, we, no matter what our orientation, our gender, our race, we all experience bias at some point in our lives, right? Um, and so I, I would invite everyone to, you know, if you have trouble understanding or relating to someone who might be part of the LGBTQIA plus community, which I might explain if we have time, <laughs> uh, just try to, try to think of a time 
when you felt that you were judged unfairly for something that you cannot control. And that is, that is what people that are part of that community experience almost on a daily basis. Uh, so just magnify that as, as many times as you can imagine, having to come out, you know, reveal part of yourself that you know might invite scorn um, fairly regularly through your life. Um, that is how you will identify with people who are struggling with these issues and hopefully, you know, inspire and, and cultivate some compassion uh, for people that are part of that community. Um, Angie sort of helped by explaining that I came from a rural area. Uh, so, you know, I had in common with many other people that are LGBTQIA+, I had the time in my life where I felt like I was the only one and that I was certainly going to die alone or be killed or, you know, something horrible was going to happen to me because of something that I couldn't control. The fact that I found men attractive and did not find women attractive. I am a gay man. Um, at a very early time in my life, I thought I wanted to be a girl when I was a child, uh, but I did not, I don't experience that gender dysphoria that folks that are transgender uh, feel. So I can relate in some way to people that are transgender, but not completely. I feel very comfortable in my gender as a man. Um, I, you know, I figured out that I really just like pretty clothes and pretty hair. And so I just, I just do that. Um, <laughs> but so I, I had actually a very easy coming out experience for a rural gay man. I, I was afraid to do it, but once it was out in the open, you know, my father did not reject me. My mother was passed away by that time, but my father did not reject me. I was not kicked out of my home. Um, honestly, students in the school gave me more crap about being, you know, gay or queer or whatever uh, before I told them that it was true than after. It was kind of like an and what, now that you know that this is true, what are you going to say? Uh, so I feel very, very lucky especially since people in my same situation are no longer with us or have had some of those negative consequences that I mentioned happen to them. Um, so after I left high school and went to college, um, feeling rather good about myself for having made that stride and come out in a rural community, uh, going to college thinking everything was going to be wonderful. I, you know, obviously college is easier. People are more open-minded. Uh, but I experienced discrimination within what I thought was going to be my own community. Uh, I, I found that coming from a rural background, it was difficult for me to relate to and integrate with uh, some of the more urban, I will say, gay men, gay people, not lesbians. I got along famously with all of the lesbians that I met when I went to college. Uh, but within the gay male community, I almost felt like, you know, I wasn't gay enough for them for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, I, I didn't have that same kind of background. I maybe was a little bit more reserved. Um, but, and then, so I always tell people, well, I bought a shiny shirt and I went to the parties that I didn't want to go to. And I went to the clubs and tried it out and felt awkward the whole time. <laughs> and it took me a long time to come into my own sense of identity versus, you know, trying to fit in with a culture that I did not relate to easily. Um, that I thought I should have very easily uh, to becoming just who I am now, which is who I am. I have a job, I do my work, I have my gardens, and I also happen to be gay. It is not the, the primary you know, part of my identity. I don't introduce myself and say, hi, I'm gay and my name is Heath. I say, hello, my name is Heath. And if it should happen to come up, I talk about my relationships. Uh, so I, I wanted to give anyone with discomfort permission to be uncomfortable. Um, as I grew older and some of my friends from college uh, actually are now transgendered and have transitioned, um, I was put face to face with some of my own discomfort that surprised the hell out of me. You know, I always thought, well, you know, I'm gay, I'm pretty open minded. But the first time that you uh, see one of your transgendered male friends and their voice has changed, it's jarring. Learning to use the language is difficult, as our first presenter said. Uh, learning to use the proper pronouns and reminding yourself it, it just because you're gay or you know bisexual queer whatever you want to call yourself it doesn't mean that you automatically get all of this stuff from birth you know we're all in the process of learning and we're all in the process of accepting ourselves and other people um, and i think from you know to relate this back to the point of rotary uh <laughs> I believe, I, know, I don't know the whole deal about what being a Rotarian is about, but it seems to be trying to improve society for the greater good. Um, and so if you, if you have discomfort, 
that is natural. Uh, I would I would call you to take a Rotarian approach to the LGBT uh, issue, and uh, the the four the four spoke the promise that you make. I'm familiar with that because there's a really cool monument in Davenport that that tells us that you don't say anything unless it's true, helpful, kind, all that. I probably am not getting that quite right, but it's very inspiring what Rotary is all about, and I, I feel like it's easily applicable to uh, working through your own personal biases and uh, growing to a place of acceptance of, of others who might be different um, okay. and to know that you're not alone. Am I, am I to the end of my time? Yes, you are. <laughs> Very good. I, I hope that I got everything in part, there. <laughs> that was great. And you'll be a part great. of the Q&A. So thank you, thank you, Wonderful. thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thanks for cutting okay. me off. <laughs> and Tony, Reverend Tony Larson. Um, I actually met him uh, just once or twice, but a couple of other folks like Brian do know him. Um, as, and Len, Reverend Dr. Tony Larson has been the minister at Unitarian Church North in Mequon for the past two years. Previous to that, he served the Olympia Brown Unitarian Universalist Church in Racine for 42 years. That's a long time. Tony studied to be a Catholic priest before transferring into the Unitarian Universalist ministry. And he's authored a book entitled, Trust Yourself, You Have the Power. He is an openly gay minister who has been married to his husband for 35 years. And thank you, Tony, for being with us tonight and sharing your story. All right, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say something about when I realized I was gay. Uh, as as, as uh, Angela said, I, I grew up, uh, I was studying to be a priest. I actually was in Catholic seminaries for um, uh, 11 years and in Catholic schools for 19 years. So from kindergarten through master's in theology, I've been at Catholic schools. Um, I'm glad that I didn't actually come out or realize that I was gay until I was about 21 years old. Uh, because if I had known earlier, uh, I would not have been as liberal and probably would have felt that I was condemned. Uh, so by the time I, came, I understood that I was gay and actually then I thought only that I was bisexual. That was easier to handle than, you know, maybe it wasn't that I was perverted. It was like I was just more liberated than most people. So, so that sounded like a cool thing to be. But as it turned out, I'm not really bisexual. I'm really gay. Um, uh, but one of the things I did, uh, in, because I was in the sort of the progressive part of the Catholic Church, uh, being gay itself was not an issue, at least not back in the, in the late 60s and early 70s. But I did study the Bible to do some research on, on what it says about homosexuality. And I, and I thought I would just share a few of those things because we don't have time to go into detail. But, um, a lot of people think that there must be a lot of stuff in the Bible that condemns homosexuality. And there's really only three passages in the whole Bible uh, that specifically reference homosexuality. One is Leviticus 18, verse 22. One is Leviticus 20, and one is Romans 1. Um, and I just give you some of these. Some of these things were not as important to me, but I found they were important to some evangelical Christians who were gay who wanted to find out what does God say about me in the Bible. So I, I did some study to find that out. And um, chapter 18 of Leviticus, the first one that condemns homosexuality, and it does refer to lying with a man as with a woman as an abomination. But you know, the word abomination is used over 130 times in the Old Testament. And it also refers to things like the abomination of eating lobster, oysters, shrimp, pork, or rabbit. Uh, the abomination of dishonesty, and the abomination of burning incense to God. So it, you, you, it's a couple of things to consider if you're going to condemn gay people because you think the Bible says so, you need to be consistent and condemn uh, the above abominations, but also eating red meat, wearing clothes that are made of a mixture of cotton and wool, planting fields with two kinds of seed, or plowing with an ox and a donkey together. Those are all condemned as abominations. You also can't paint a picture or sculpt a statue or get tattooed. If you're a man, you can't trim the edges of your beard or change your granddaughter's diapers or play football. Since Leviticus for <laughs> the skin or carcass of a pig. All right. The other passage is 2013 in Leviticus. 
And it does say the death penalty. As you know, the death penalty was also prescribed for committing adultery, calling up ghosts and spirits, spending money with interest. So that would lead, take care of all the bankers. And even saying things, uh, mean things about your mother or father, you could be killed for that. Uh, you were also supposed to stone to death your brother or your son or your daughter or your wife or your best friend if they tried to convert you to another religion. Now, those are the only two passages in the Old Testament. Uh, the, there are others that people sometimes think are, but really aren't. Uh, and in the New Testament, there's one in Paul, but since I only have a minute left, I'll mention Jesus. We have this little pamphlet that says what, G what uh, Jesus said about homosexuality. And if you open it up, it's blank. So if Jesus had any feelings about homosexuality, he never mentioned, uh, mentioned that. Um, anyway, my, my feeling is that if you look at the Bible through the lens of the, the important commandment to love, love God and to love your neighbor, um, you'll have no problem. All right. Tony, thank you. And um, appreciate that. Um, our next segment is going to be re, uh, a playing of a recording. And uh, Len, who's a member of our task force, was kind enough to do this interview with Barb Farrer because um, she was not able to be with us tonight. Let me first introduce Barb, who will be in this recording. Um, Barb is the executive director of the LGBTQ Center of Southeast Wisconsin and has been for 12 <laughs> years. Prior to that, she was with the uh, University of Wisconsin Parkside in the Human Resources Department. Um, she is an Ames, Iowa native and she is an out lesbian. She is uh, someone who is very appreciative that she can be working in an environment that is there for the community. And by being able to grow and serve this community, she just feels good about being able to um, participate in something that is near and dear to her as an individual. Um, Len Yakinta is a native of Kenosha, Wisconsin, and he's the past president of the Kenosha Rotary Club. And he's been a Rotarian for most of his professional life. Len has held leadership positions in LGBTQ plus organizations beginning back in 1971. And that was back in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I was actually there just last week with my mom. And most recently, he's been the past president of the LGBT Center of Southeast Wisconsin. He's a not-for-profit career professional mm -hmm. fundraiser of millions of dollars in major gifts, grants, and sustaining funds. If any of you work in nonprofit, you understand then what he does. Uh, he's been recognized as a strategic and tactical thinker. He's passionate about improving the culture of philanthropy and augmenting the performance of not-for-profit organizations in fund development and public communications. And we were so lucky that he participated in an early DEI session for the district and said, you know, this is something I can get passionate about and be a part of. And so he's sharing his talents and his skills of podcasting with this presentation tonight. And I would ask my brother, if any of you saw Christopher Rester, Chris Rester, he uh, filled in for us tonight as our host and Chris will now start that video. I'm Len Iquinta, and I'm interviewing Barb Farrar, Executive Director of the LGBT right. Center of Southeast Wisconsin. Barb, uh, we have a few questions for you, and we appreciate your coming on board with us. How should one respond in the initial moment when someone comes out to you? Um, it might be a child, it might be uh, your family member, or, uh, or a colleague at work. Uh, what do you say? Yeah, that's a really good question, Len. Um, first of all, you have to know that if they are coming out to you, it's because either they feel comfortable with you enough to um, share that part of themselves, or they have a need. Like if you are their employer, then there may be a need beyond um, 
uh, just being their employee. For example, they if they're transgender, they may need to use a different bathroom, or they may want to change their name or their um, or their uh, business card. So there may be reasons why they do that. Um, if somebody is coming out to you, the most important thing is just to listen and to accept their story and to um, support them in what, whatever way they, they need. Now, if it's your child, is there anything special that needs to be said? Um, I think the most important thing that you can say is, I love you, <laughs> assuming you do, and I'm pretty sure you do. Um, but just to say, I love you for who you are. Um, and try to avoid, it's just a phase, you'll grow out of this, because um, if somebody, if a child is telling their parent, it's because it's real, and it's true, they wouldn't just make this up. Now, saying, uh, well, this is just a phase, and you'll grow out of it, really is a, a denial of their personhood in a way, isn't it? That's right, and that can cause a bridge, um, or that can cause a rift in a relationship that can never be repaired, so it's important to be respectful. Now, suppose it's not your child, uh, but a, a family member in your uh, immediate family or a more extended family, cousins, uncles, the nieces, nephews. Mm -hmm. In that case, it's since in that case, to me, they're trusting you. They are telling you out of the whole family because they trust you. And perhaps they're even looking for a safe place or a safe person to have private conversations with that may not be their parent. Or perhaps they're asking, um, they might ask your advice, like, how should we tell grandma if um, I don't feel, if you're the aunt, uh, how, how do we approach this with grandma? And your answer may be, grandma doesn't need to know. It does, it's okay. It's, uh, but you're safe with me and, and uh, I support you and love you no matter what. And that reassurance is very important, isn't it? It is very important. Now let's switch. I'm at work, I'm at the office. Uh, or I'm uh, working in some other setting and uh, a colleague makes that, conf confides in me. Uh, what, what should my response be in that case, Barb? Um, well, really, <clears throat> excuse me, your, your employment has nothing to do with your sexual orientation or gender identity. If you're making decisions whether to hire somebody or to keep them on staff, based on their sexual orientation or gender identity, you as an employer are getting yourself into not only legal, potential legal issues, but um, not being a supportive and welcoming environment for everyone. So as an employer, I would recommend, or as a boss, I would recommend that you, again, say thank you for sharing this information with me. I know it was probably hard for you to come out. I will do everything I can to make sure that our work Place is inclusive. So for example, if you use language like, hey, the Christmas party is coming up, make sure to bring your husband or wife, then that, uh, now granted, the person may have a wife, a same-sex wife, uh, but um, just making sure your language is inclusive and that um, your benefits are inclusive as well. What about the case where it's not a power relationship in terms of, you know, employee or supervisor, but just, you know, a, the colleague at the next desk or at the next workstation. Yeah, in that case, um, everybody needs friends, right? And everybody needs a safe person to confide in. But just because they confide in you does not mean that they are out or want you to share their story. So it's really important that you have that conversation um, Bob, are you out? Is this something that I should share? Or is this just between us? That can cause, um, that can solve many, many problems if you have that um, confidential conversation. Can we talk a little bit more, Barb, about how one responds in a compassionate way, regardless of your uh, personal convictions or religious convictions? And, and maybe uh, talk a little bit about the dangers of a thoughtless response and, and uh, how serious that could be. Sure, I think we all have a journey and we are all on our own path. And um, for a, a compassionate response would be, I'm proud of you for being who you are and I'm proud of you for living the life that you need to live. Um, regardless of whether you have a religious um, objection to somebody's sexual orientation or gender identity. As it comes to sexual orientation and gender identity, gender identity specifically, if, if somebody feels that they are not being respected for who they are, there's a term called dysphoria, gender dysphoria, which 
is a feeling that um, uh, an individual can struggle not being in alignment with their sexual, uh, with their gender identity. For example, if you were assigned male at birth and have always felt in your mind and your soul that you are a female and you start to go through that physical transition to become a woman or the woman that you've always been and you're not accepted, that can be devastating. It can cause anxiety depression, and even suicidal thoughts. It's very important to be very compassionate. And if you are not that person, suggest that they see a therapist or or come to the LGBT Center for a support group. Uh, what um, would you say is appropriate behavior thereafter, after that first confession? And, and uh, I'll just make a footnote here. I think the most terrifying things I've ever done in my life, which was now quite some time ago, was to come out to a colleague or a friend. Uh, what if, and, and, and what if you mess up? What if you look back and what if someone listening to this program tonight says, oh my gosh, I did the wrong thing with so-and-so uh, last week. What do I do now? How do I recover? What should I do? Yeah, that's a really good question. And sometimes we're really hard on ourselves. Heck, we're, we're all human. We all make mistakes. I even misgender people that I know and who I'm close to. And it's, it is, you know, you sometimes have a visual and it doesn't always match the pronoun that you're using. So you apologize, sorry, and you move on. Don't belabor the point. Don't make it such a huge deal. Just say, sorry, and correct yourself and move on. Um, again, if, if somebody has come out to you, maybe there's been some time um, you might just check in and say, how are you? It's that authentic honesty and acceptance that makes all the difference. If you avoid them, avoid those conversations, they're going to assume that you, they don't, you don't like them or that they are wrong and it, it can cause more trouble. Can we briefly talk about pronouns? Uh, people get very confused about them. What about pronouns? Why do they matter? Uh, what should I say? Sure. So again, if you were assigned uh, one sex at birth and have always felt that you were different, for example, if you were born male, uh, assigned male at birth, but identify as a female, using that correct pronoun, um, even if you've known somebody since they were 16 and expressed, that's the word we say, they look um, male, uh, you do your best to always use the female pronoun. If not, it can be very damaging. Um, just an exercise, or if somebody is non-binary, so they're not male or female, and they use the pronouns they, them. They, them is really somebody who's on the spectrum. They're not male or female. They feel somewhere in between neither, neither gender or both genders or something in between. So they, them can be the most difficult, but once you get it, once you understand that they identify as both, then that plural can be very helpful. That's very, very helpful. Barb, uh, where can uh, our uh, viewers find more resources? Sure, for the Southeast Wisconsin area, the LGBT Center of Southeast Wisconsin located in Racine, serving Walworth and Kenosha counties, as well as Racine County, um, is an excellent place to go. And if you're not able to physically go to the center, you can go to our website or Facebook page and just you know, Google LGBTSEWI and you will find all of our different uh, platforms. Now, there are uh, other um, areas and counties in our Rotary districts that will be viewing this. Uh, where else in, in uh, the sort of the southeastern quadrant of the state of Wisconsin, uh, where one might find a center? I know there's one in Milwaukee. Yeah, the Milwaukee LGBT Center is a very large organization. They've got a robust staff, many services. Um, Walworth County has a Pride Fest and a, a newly formed center in Waukegan um, is, is budding up and they just had a Pride event. So there are anything, uh, anything north of Milwaukee right now in terms of a um, actual center? Uh, Fox Valley has a center for youth. Um, and Madison, of course, has a center. Um, those are the biggies. Great. Yeah. Now, I, I believe that you've uh, agreed to provide us with a, a, a list of resources that we will make available to our viewers. Is, is that correct? 
Yes, that's correct. And and while we're talking about regions, since since the pandemic has um, shown us that you don't have to physically be in the same space, now the virtual support groups that we offer in the virtual program can be seen by anybody anywhere. So we have multiple states represented every week in some of our groups. So that's really exciting. And as we uh, open up again, we will continue to have a hybrid of in-person and virtual programming. So you have a wide range of support groups across the spectrum. And uh, does there a cost to access these resources usually? No, they're all free. We believe that everybody should be able to have access to support and programming regardless of income. Bob Farrar, Executive Director of the LGBT Center of Southeast Wisconsin, I thank you on behalf of the Rotary Districts. Thank you so very much for your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Len. Thank you for that, Len and Barb and Chris for being able to run that with audio. <laughs> um, what we're going to do now is something that I know people kind of hate and that is role playing. Um, and it's not as much a role playing as much as I would like it to be some introspection and just an opportunity to take this moment in time and try to um, begin to build awareness and the ability for your mind to just think about this for a moment and not all of a sudden after we're done tonight get back into your busy worlds and and not have a moment to try and put this into languaging we're going to have you just break into twos randomly and as a random participant your role is that for two minutes you will share how you might respond to a grandchild, a friend, a coworker, you choose the situation, but I want you to think about how might you language that? And what, what's your initial re response? You're thinking internally, because that building of awareness is what will help you that first time or that next time that it might happen. And then it's up to the two of you to monitor only two minutes, and then the other person shares. And then you're going to come back and we'll go into the Q&A. It's not a time that you're going to share what you talked about. We're not going to have a, a report back. I just want this to be wheels on the bus. You get a chance to start to, to think about how this information will help you moving forward. So Chris, if you could uh, put everybody into groups of two and you to determine if if someone, if someone uh, specific they want to address the question to or the panel. And if you want to say something, can you hit chat with your hand up, panelists? If, if you oh, no. want to- Well, it'd be, it'd be reactions. Bottom right is reactions, there's a hand up. Like if you look at my screen right now, boom, I just raised my hand. And we just go like this. You know what? Yeah, okay, just go like this. Yeah. Well, and, if you do, and honestly, if you do that, I also tell my, my students, put it right in front of the camera so we can see it. Oh, good. Okay. We have a whole bunch. Of Otherwise, you might just be, you know, you might just be twirling your curls. And Marta and-, and Especially Chris you, Tony, I can tell. Help see that. <laughs> oh. If the person don't want to- open their camera and they want to ask a question again they can send me they can either post the question in the chat as an everyone question or if they want to keep themselves um anonymous. anonymous they can send it to me directly i will read the question without saying the name of the person perfect and i'm going to remind them of that in just a minute or do you want to marta when we come back on and i after i introduce the q a um, I think that most of the people are. Back. I think they heard it. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but we can. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope that it was an uh, an opportunity to start to um, think about how this information might be useful in the future. Um, we're going to go into the Q and A time, and you'll have an opportunity to direct your question to specifically one person or two on the panel or if you wanna just ask a question and we'll have panelists uh, indicate who wants to respond and more than one if they'd like. 
Um, if you wish to remain anonymous in a question or a comment, then please, you know, turn your camera off, the video part of your, um, and you can ask the question. Or if you think people would recognize your voice and you really don't want that, then you can send a private chat message to Marta Carrion, and she will then read your question on your behalf without mentioning a name. So we want to respect where everyone is at in this conversation. So um, with that. Can okay. I just jump in? It might be if people are able to use the reactions on the bottom right, it's like you do the raise your hand. If you watch my, my little square, as soon as I hit raise my hand, I move all the way to the top left, at least on a computer screen. Yes. Then it can be, you know, it would be less of a free for all kind of. Thank we have you. a question in chat, Angie. And there yeah. is a question already, Angie, um, okay. that it was posted in the chat, but it wasn't addressed to any particular member. It's my daughter and her partner are considering children. Your thoughts will be appreciated about this. Who would like to address that? The most states have uh, have. Uh, uh, things in place to do that. I know that there was just a Supreme Court decision about a Catholic charity that was um, not willing to have LGBT community adopt. Unfortunately, I mean, the Supreme Court. So we still need some work done with that. But um, I, I I think we all should have children if we want to raise children. To me, it's just, it's uh, yes, yes, yes. I'll be the grandma. Uh, we're good. Was that a Wisconsin Supreme Court decision? Uh, no, it Court. was. It, no, it was. Unfortunately, the country. Yep. It applied to a very specific charity. Uh, that what? was a Just religious one. charity. And it was applied to that particular case and the peculiarity of the way the city administered uh, its regulations. So its applicability elsewhere is, uh, is uh, in question. I think right. one of the very important things in terms of uh, making the decision and then carrying it out is just make sure you get the best advice you possibly can, including legal advice from uh, people who know what they're talking about, uh, as well as having your support systems in place. But this is being successfully done by adoption or other means all across the country and the, and the world. And uh, But it requires a supportive environment and family to the maximum extent, just like any other, any other starter of a family does. One more thing I can share with that is that I have a couple that adopted twins and when they did unfortunately divorce, um, they were not both parents legally. So definitely what Len said, check out what your statutes are locally and how it, if you're married locally, if that also extends to parenting. Um, so definitely check that out and have a lawyer um, check it out. And like Len said, it was just one charity that this happened to. So it's basically the language. Thank you. Hopefully, all. you mean state law, correct? There's no ordinances from county to county on this or city to city. Yes, that's really a state matter. Right. Yeah. Andy, you have someone, um, Jim DeLong. Uh, DeLong? Jim DeLong, yes. Yeah, they have, they have their hand up. Yeah. Hi, this is Jim DeLong, and uh, I just uh, had an uh, interesting discussion with Frank, made a new friend. And the question that I uh, asked and then went on to answer myself, which is not unusual, uh, was as a, trying to be a good Rotarian and given the experiences that I've had, I have two gay uh, sons, uh, how, how, what can I do um, to help out um, in the Rotary? And uh, how he answered it was to just, in essence, come out to my Rotary Club and say, hey, I'm, I'm a parent who's gone through this. Uh, my son is, is happily married. He's been married for five years. Um, and uh, my younger son um, is single. And uh, we seem to have, uh, you know, muddled through the very best uh, that, that we can. And uh, I'm proud to say that, you know, our, our family is, is very happy and, and what I believe to be is very well adjusted. And so, as uh, trying to be the best Rotary member I can, I think it's uh, imperative for me to step up uh, to my club and say, hey, here's who I am. If you didn't see this uh, Rotary 
uh, uh, video and they, they've recorded it, I suggest you take a look at it. And if you want to talk to someone, I am here for you. I, I would certainly underscore that. Uh, thank you so much. And I think it's also important to call out bad behavior and inappropriate speech when you, when you hear it. Uh, I think it's extremely important uh, in all forms of bigotry and hate. And um, we tend not to, we tend to go along. And I can tell you that uh, we've all been guilty of it and I have too. But I think that um, being open about your situation and your knowledge, as you suggested, is extremely powerful. And also calling out hate when you see it. Yes, uh, the call out, I think, is critical. I, I'm with you 100% there. Totally agree. Tony, you have a comment? Yes, uh, I just wanted to mention that years ago, um, our the church I was serving in Racine had a gay rap group, and it had been meant, it, this is about forty years ago, so it was it was a big deal then. Um, and um, I forget one call from somebody who who said, "I read about your gay rap group." Of course, we got we got messages from people who thought it was terrible and would say we were all going to hell. But this one man said, "You know, I wish I'd known about your church." before because he said about 10 years ago my son came up to me and we didn't know whether my wife and I didn't know whether to to say it's okay or to kind of do a tough love thing and, and disown him and he said I'm really glad that we we said we love you anyway and he says because we later found out he was thinking of suicide and he said it really would have been helpful to me if I had known that a church like yours existed and what I take from that is the more the rest of us say things about people who are gay that we know uh, and, and normalize it. That makes a gigantic difference for a lot of other people who otherwise will not know. I really agree. And one, uh, Brenda? one other thing I can include, if I can, um, is that whenever I would be introduced in a group, I would say I would be an LGBT, LGBT community ally. So you'd all this, all you have to say, and that opens up a conversation. Someone can pull you over to the side afterwards. But if you just right. have that included in your in your introduction, it kind of just opens a clear path. Thank you, guys. And I would say that that's why this is being done tonight. Um, we as Rotarians need to re we, we're concerned about diversity and equity and inclusion in all aspects. But sometimes we forget that maybe that we hold one more as more important than another. And I think the fact that Rotary talks about being inclusive means that we really do need to act on that. And so we do need to be allies and we do need to call people out. And I really appreciate Jim, your sharing. And, and Brian knows that I felt it was very important that Brian be willing to share his story because a lot of Rotarians know him and they respect him and they see him as someone that they emulate. And if, if he can come and share his story, that helps to make people feel that this is not an, uh, as something that's abnormal or something that can't be talked about. So I do think it's important that all of us uh, be able to share. You know, I, as, as my brother Chris knows, um, we have a niece that honestly, I gave her a Barbie doll when she was four years old and she looked at me with disdain and disgust and so, so happy when she was able to take it back and trade it in for all her boy toys from Target. And we watched her grow up and it wasn't a question. And so when you have had that experience, you need to be an ally, you need to speak, you need to share. Um, and Rotary needs to be comfortable with this. We've had more comments. We've had comments like, you know, if this is what Rotary is gonna be about, then I'm getting out of Rotary. Well. Nope. Andy, I think that we she froze. We froze. Um, but I know that <clears throat> Connie has her hand Hi. up and Len has his hand up. So I don't know which one was first. I think Connie was there first. Oh, oh was she? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to know how to be supportive and sensitive to an. Uh, an individual either in the family or, or my family of friends who I know to be, uh, I know the individual is gay, but that individual is not yet willing to say so. How do I provide support? Uh, 
I, my, my impression is that in group situations where, you know, like we would in, in our two minute, uh, two person discussion, um, uh, my colleague said that her nephew, she knows her nephew is, is gay and he's only come out to one person in the family and that person has not shared that information, obviously. Um, but that, you know, others like another generation will say, how come you don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend yet? Mm -hmm. You know, kind of thing. How in that situation when they, you know they're uncomfortable with that kind of a question, how do you provide support without forcing them to to come out if they're not ready to. Uh, I know. Thank you, Connie, for your question. Tony, Tony is uh, not, ready to respond. Tony, will, then Len, you will set your turn to Tony. OK. Well, he wants it's, to respond to the it's question. A response, it's a response to that particular question. OK. Uh, it, I think it's important to let people know where you stand and then let them decide whether to come out. I do know. In my case, there was a time or two when I told someone I was gay and I was, you know, it was, it was earnest about it. They were important to me. I wanted them to know. And they said, oh, yeah, well, God, I knew that already. And that scared me because I thought, am I that obvious? And so you, you don't you don't want to tell someone I can tell that you're gay. Why don't you talk about it? Um, they may be very worried about everyone else knowing that they're gay. So if they're being reticent. It just accept that, but you make it clear by things that you say what your general feeling is, and then you let them be the one to decide whether they're going to come out to you or not. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to echo that to the point, and uh, you know, I don't know, I, but uh, I think that I would, uh, I'd find some uh, something to celebrate about the uh, the LGBTQAI plus community and say, oh, that court decision or that uh, that story mm -hmm. about the such and such a football player or a movie star mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, I think there are ways you can bring it up to let you know, right. let people know that you're safe. But, you know, um, I don't think it's possible to convey how frightening it is to come out to the first five or six people. I have never done anything more terrifying in my entire life. Um, and I know that sounds, you know, God, he's a drama queen, but you talk to any person in the community and they will probably tell you the same thing. It is a terrifying thing to do. Um, now, and it's things haven't changed that much for young people, especially in many communities. And I, the, the point I wanted to make folks is that while we're talking about people who are mainly younger now, uh, since I'm an old coot of 77, I want to point out that we have a whole generation, I'm a war baby, but the baby boomers are right behind me. And those of us who are in this community are terrified because we're the ones who were preyed upon. We're the ones who were experimented on. We were the ones who were told by the psychiatrists how sick we were. And so uh, in order to get the care from medical and assisted living and so forth, uh, we have a lot of fear of coming out and telling people what we need. So those of you who are in those professions dealing with the elderly uh, need to think very carefully because we're, we're not gonna come out unless we know it's safe and we're terrified. Andy, you are muted, just so you know. Can unmute there. Thank you. Um, it is uh, seven fifteen. I do want to wrap up, but I want to invite anyone who'd like to stay in the conversation to stay with us uh, till seven thirty. Our most of our panelists are able to continue with us and and have asked to actually continue if there are people who'd like to. Uh, you will all be receiving a list of, a link to resources. Um, again, I can't thank you enough for this beginning, this hors d'oeuvre, this um, thought provoking. Uh, conversation and hope that you'll continue on um, and ask the district, ask uh, to have presentations to your club, look for ways to expand the thinking 
the acceptance, the tolerance even, if, it, if that's the best that someone can do at this point, so that we can be an inclusive organization. Um, you know, my husband is a, a born again Christian and he has had a lot of struggles around this. And he met a friend of mine, Bill Serpy, who has now passed. <clears throat> Um, that was SAGE, uh, Seniors in a Gay Environment. Right. And Bill made a very important point when he said to my husband, you know, Robert, why would I choose to be ostracized by members of my family? Why would I choose to not be able to go into work and talk about the person that I had a great weekend with and that I love and that I've been with for 36 years? Why would I choose this? Exactly. And I think we need to really... Um, as Rotarians, seek to understand, um, help others to understand, to remember that this is about love and peace in the world, to really uh, make a difference in especially young people's lives. We know that gay, LGBTQ identifying uh, young people, their suicide rate is so high because they don't know that they can openly share who they are. And too many of them are driven into the street and too many of them into sex trafficking, et cetera, things that we as Rotarians care about. So I hope that you'll continue this conversation. I hope that you'll be strong enough to, to get your other club members to try to open up in their thinking. And with that, I'll close the session officially. I thank my brother and Marta for hosting. I uh, really appreciate all of our panelists and Barb who could not be here in person and invite you to stay if you're not um, on a clock and need to run off now. Whoa, baby. Share comments <laughs> if you liked it, what you learned from it. Uh, please share comments. Uh, send me an email. I'm at CDG Rester Sampsi at AOL.com. Um, we'd love to hear more, but we can do more and do better. Thanks again. Does anyone, I see he has his hand up. Go he. Do you want me, Angie, do you want me to stop the recording now or continue recording? Uh, no, I think continue recording. Sure. We'll continue. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Am I unmuted? Yes, you yes. are. Yeah. Okay, very good. So I, I just wanted to build on what Len said, and because um, part of the point that I wanted to offer was for us on our side of it, you know, people that are LGBTQIA+, whatever you might identify as, um, I recognize that some of the feedback we give people who disagree or don't feel comfortable with or whatever you want to call it, uh, says people or the lifestyle or anything, they do from their perspective, received some pretty sharp, <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it. We're, we're very vocal at times and that, that is both right and it justifies how they already feel. I, I want to, to lend a, a note of sympathy to people who don't agree with me and who you know, might for a religious reason, perhaps, or for a way they were raised otherwise reason, just not be able to get over that hump. And then they're screamed at, you know, on social media in particular, that stuff I feel like is counterproductive and I'm totally guilty of it. I've been that person. And I, to relate it to what Len said, the reason for that vitriol is the terror that we felt in the time before we were able to be on, like be our true selves. So for anyone who has experienced being yelled at by a rabid liberal about gay issues, I, I'd like to say that that might be part of the reason why people are so angry. And I apologize for that. Um, it doesn't make it right either that some of us act that way about it, but that is probably a lot of why. And so like, I think everyone just needs to understand that we're all affected by these biases. It brings more pain to the world than needs to be there. And we all have a part to play in, in shutting it down and bringing, you know, bringing about some peace. It's probably not my place to say, but every movement needs a tip of the spear. And that's the, that's the vocal fringe. 
If, if I can add something about what Len said too, Len, you were very honest in saying that you know there are times when you've you know you had just had to deal with your own homophobia, and I think that's just a really important thing. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that in my early days, I just thought I was bisexual because it was easier to accept. Later on, when someone told me they were bisexual, I thought, oh, honey, you're just kidding yourself. But they really are bisexual. Yes. Because that was my experience as a phase I was going through. That doesn't mean it's for everybody else. Uh, and, and then the other thing was the fear. I remember walking with a friend of mine who was more flamboyant than me. And I was so embarrassed because I thought everyone's going to know I'm gay because I'm what he's going, hi, how are you? And I'm thinking, oh my God, they're going to know I'm gay. I was more homophobic than any straight, any of his straight friends because I was thinking about that. So we, we, we all deal with this stuff if we're honest and we have to come to terms with it. Thank you, I think Francis has a question. Well, actually, I have a comment. One thing that I don't think we've talked about is the person who maybe doesn't know that he or she is gay. I have um, a brother who is now in his 80s, but through high school, he dated girls through, you know, and later on an adult. Um, he thought he was called to priesthood, so he thought he was going to go and do that. And it took him a long time to come to terms with himself, to realize, I guess, with himself. And I told the fellow that we were, I was partnered with, um, he was probably in his late 40s, early 50s before he came out to the family. And he came out at my dad's, our dad's funeral um, because he was afraid to tell his mom and, and all of, he was one of 11. And we all just said, yeah, <laughs> you know, like, exactly. okay, <laughs> yeah, what, what's no, what are you yeah. telling us? So, I mean, everybody knew, but he didn't know for the longest time. And right. We, right. we didn't talk about that. So. I have two friends in high school that both of them have shared that they didn't they they knew something was different but they didn't even know the word gay they didn't even understand that that was a, a, a way of being and uh, my girlfriend denise she uh she told her mother you know i'm attracted to so and so and her mother said oh you'll grow out of it and it wasn't until she went off and into a larger community and realized that oh no this is who i am yeah. so it is challenging it's challenging Jim. hi mark i'd like to thank you um, Jim, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, one of the things that um, I learned from my son uh, that kind of surprised me was that as he was realizing uh, that he was gay, um, before he could talk about it to us, he asked some um, in non-directed questions, some probes that kind of tried to figure out where um, his mom and dad were on uh, their attitudes and you know we we failed the test and that just made him say well my gosh I, I don't think I'm going to be safe in this and it, as it turned out uh, you know how it is that we learned was uh, uh, you know unorchestrated and um, but you know we recovered gracefully and so I just wanted to um, share that sometimes you know the questions that you may be getting from people uh are kind of probes that say you know where where do you stand on all this and, and and can i be safe with you and i you know my wife and i we were like my gosh we we were clueless mm -hmm. yeah that, um, that's very common that goes on a lot that's what we all do uh, in various situations uh, to, to test the waters. Uh, and uh, you couldn't have said it better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, something that I'd love to see people touch on in future data is um, employing uh, and who, how we act as employers. I have to be honest that I am so impressed with Landmark. Um, uh, to not a bank, but it is a credit union. And I was going into a mine here in Grafton and there was a young man that I watched over the year start to grow long hair, start to put fingernail polish on, and then trans he started to wear um, skirts.
skirt and blouses. And one day we just talked and yes, he was uh, transgender and he was uh, going through that in his employment and Landmark was so gracious and welcoming, but they also did at one point say, you know, I think at this point now we need to transfer you. And they did transfer him to a West End uh, Landmark, but they, they were an employer that was gracious in permitting him to be who he was and become who he, she, she wanted to be. And not all employers would do that. They should. They should. Yeah. Say, it doesn't matter. Uh, person's a person's a person. Yeah. No matter how small. <laughs> or I've big. Always, I've always I just said want to my husband, how, how does knowing that she's gay, this was a volleyball partner, how does knowing she's gay now make any real difference from how you felt about her 10 minutes ago? Right. So how is the knowledge and the that this person is part of the LGBTQ community. How is it, how's your thinking about them being affected when 10 minutes ago you thought the, the world of them? So making people stop to think, you know, what's really my bias here? Uh, One thing again, I just want to bring up again is language. language. I just wanted to bring up language because a lot of people don't like to be identified as gay. So for you just use the initials in all aspects until you ask the person what they want to be identified as is I, I am an ally of the LGBT community. Um, you can use the QIA as well, but LGBT kind of covers, not that it covers all, but um, instead of the girl is gay or so we don't have to identify because whatever they want to identify and I'm good with all, but I'm just an ally of the community. So that it's a safe place to use those. Initiatives. You will hear members of the community refer to ourselves as queer, a word that we have reclaimed and defanged. Uh, it's best to let us talk about ourselves as queer than to you use that word, but it's often used in a generic way to cover the right. spectrum. And uh, thinking of that as a spectrum is, is wise. Now, older people uh, in a different generation at the very beginning of the, the modern movement uh, for gay liberation, uh, we used gay as the inclusive term, but that mm -hmm. is now out of style. Right. Yeah. Because we are trying to be, we're trying to name it. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that at that time to try to find a bisexual person to come out and stay, say so was not as easy as you might think. And I was a leader in the movement at that time, and I can attest to that. But things have changed and we have all evolved. Yeah. Keith, what is I age? Oh, I was just going to say real quick, I, I am 40 years old, so I'm kind of in between some of the younger generations and some of the older generations. And when I was in school, they still played smear the queer with dodgeball. So I'm not crazy about the word queer, but I've had to get used to it as something that is, this is what they're doing now. And this is great, but it's still hard for me because of that yeah. trauma. That's all yeah. I wanted to say about that. Yep. And what if I eat? Intersex, asexual. What what are some of the letters? I A, Heath. Well, the A can, the A can stand for ally as well. It, yeah. So in my role, right? Yeah, with the ally, and in, in my role as a HIV and you know general sexual health promoter or counselor, um, we we get a lot of professional development related to keeping up with the terms, and so that has been super helpful for me as a gay man who wasn't born knowing the terms because none of us are. Um, and, you know, LGBTQIA right now is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, uh, intersex, and allies. And then they put the plus because just in case, because yeah. they're always making up new words, you know? And it, he was and they, questioning they, as well, is it not? Right. Yep. Yes. She was yeah. questioning. Yeah. Yes. And can also be yes. asexual. Yeah. So today, today I feel, stick the H in there tomorrow I feel, yeah, I don't know if Patty Lynch is still with us. Patty, if you are, um, I know that she's she, not. Uh, she's not. Okay, we um, we have flags. For Wait, do you mean the, with us in like the global sense? Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> She's with us. But we um, for our club, we have all the flags representing the now ten different uh, international or nationalities, 
and we now have yeah. a pride yeah. flag. And when we had our event last week, Patty came to me and, and she said she nearly cried when she saw it. She was so proud of our club. And um, she is a junior high uh, teacher and counselor. And she said that just recently she's had four kids come out to her. This is seventh wow. and eighth graders. And again, to be able to have th that gift of someone sharing because they trust you. But we don't, we, we all need to do better and really help, you know, Rotarians understand that that's a gift and how do they help, you know, who, uh, what was his name, uh, Jim. Jim was saying that there can be these probes that people send out kind of like to check out the environment before they share. So it's important that we always really have that, that lens uh, so that we can uh, hear what's not being said and respond in, in at the best appropriateness that we can. Sure, sure. I, I really want to hear from the people who even after watching this are still in their same spot. Like, honestly, let, let me have it. Let me, let me hear why you feel the way that you do. And there's got to be something valid about what they say. Um, I, I fall into the trap, like I said, all the time of just joining in the, you know, well, there's some things that you just cannot tolerate. And I, I do feel that way. I feel like there's some things that you cannot tolerate, but someone's opinion spoken out loud should never be one of those things. Like they should feel as safe as we do talking about this exactly. stuff. To just say it out loud into yeah, the space. I agree. Good May point. I jump in here for a sec? Sure. And then we're going to be having to wrap up, I think. Okay. Uh, I'm generally... Uh, not too keen on congressional testimonies, uh, but there was one that absolutely riveted me. Uh, it was done by Adam Grant, uh, who's a uh, professor at Wharton, and they were talking about the DOD, and he said, because the DOD is not a place where it is psychologically safe, which means I can be myself without fear of being bullied or teased or whatever, and because they're using management techniques that were born in the 50s, the DOD is a risk to national security. So I have great hope that uh, there is uh, an awakening that is coming. You know, I, I have that hope as well, but I, I'll be honest, and Brenda, you're still on this. We had talked about, um, Marta and I last night talked and she was like so hopeful about the younger generation. And I agree with her, but then I also have a complete fear because I'm watching Cedarburg, uh, Greenfield, Oconomowoc. I'm watching school districts where they're not addressing it and kids are being bullied and pushed out of school. Brenda, you're very active in this and know more about it. What would you Just say? The, the current Cedarburg, um, there was a mural by the middle school um, Alliance group and they made a mural and it was a world with people holding hands had one pride flag, it said, love is universal. That's what the mural is. And the principal of the school and the school district covered it up when they had smaller children come to classes. And there's an outrage going on in Facebook and there should be more of an outrage as far as I'm concerned. But it's, it's I have a friend who has a transgender um, granddaughter who was gonna start the school in as a five-year-old and is not no longer gonna go to the school. So the safety of it is the principal of the school thought a rainbow flag and a world with people holding hands was a bad influence for children. Yeah, they have Come uncovered on. it since then. And, and I'm going to go a heat. I'm like, I'm sorry, that's, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. I want to slap you upside the head. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say as a current junior high school teacher in a fairly socially liberal, uh, economically conservative community, man, people need to get more involved in like the, the school board elections and stuff like that. Because, you know, if we're waiting for the federal government to mandate tolerance and acceptance, it's, that ain't gonna happen. You know, and I think a lot of the things that I see here in Naperville with our schools, you know, it's a little insidious when you hear you know, people talking about a liberal agenda in the in the uh, uh, the curriculum, things like that. And I almost feel like it's code for like too many brown people, too many not straight people, mm -hmm. and it just I mean, school board elections in my book 
are the most important elections of the year because wow. school boards and and city council those those have more impact than anything else and you know honestly i think with the way our our society is with social media and whatnot um you know and i can't speak for for anybody else but my sense is that older folks who have dealt with this and are moving through and working through coming out and dealing with society are probably better equipped than the average 11 or 12 year old. And those are the kids we really need to protect. And those are the kids who are in the junior highs that are, you know, uh, dealing with, uh, for lack of a better term, shitty school board policies that aren't all inclusive. Well said. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You guys, I can't begin to thank you enough. Um, I think it was a great session. I'm looking forward to reading comments and I hope you know that um, this is a conversation that continues each time we do one of these. Um, it's just a, a, a bite. And we as Rotarians, I think really need to do everything that we can to invite these kinds of conversations into our clubs. And as he said, invite the dissenters that you know to hear them um we we can't begin to understand someone's fear and address it without understanding where they're coming from so please as libertarians do everything you can to help uh do more thank you thanks for having us wow well, thank you thank you, thank you. Thanks. 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 And Christopher, of course, I love you, and I thank you for being able to Thanks. do this. Go Bears! Oh, <laughs> oh man. I don't know about that. I saved oh, it to the end. It was so good. It was Keep so shot. good for so long. Keep shot. <laughs> yes. Go Bucks! <laughs> yeah. Go Aaron! Go Aaron Rodgers! Like away! <laughs> bye, goodbye. Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Chris, you're able to capture like the chat and all that. You know what is to do, and I don't. Um, well, I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. Yeah.